Confucius is one of those personages in history that uh, illustrates the sort of person who could triumph over all the odds against him. And he's a fascinating person to uh, study for that reason. Uh, he was born uh, in a educated, literate family, but a very poor family, very low on the bureaucratic scale. Um, his father was a, a provincial uh, official. Uh, he was very resentful as a child. He was, he was, his father educated him, but he was very resentful of the fact that when he finally got a position as a bureaucrat, he was doing all kinds of, of dreary uh, work that, that uh, he didn't feel was uh, suitable for his, uh, his intellect. Um, he was also a scholar and a very, apparently very gentle man in a time of great violence because he, was, he, came, he came of age in the 5th and 6th century in China in which you had a whole series of states that were at war with each other. Um, it was a very rough and tumble thing. He also, as he grew up, he was a very brilliant man. He didn't, didn't suffer fools um, gladly and he was always in search of the ideal ruler whom he could advise and who would be a great emperor and he couldn't hold the position. So in a sense, in terms of his actual career, he was a failure. But, it's, but remarkably, because of what he thought and because he had disciples who were also very, very powerful intellects, who wrote about, they actually they recorded most of his teachings in, the, in what is called the Analects, a, a compilation of, of his sayings and his, his wisdom. At any rate, uh, he, he never found the ideal king and he went, he wandered from kingdom to kingdom. He never made a lot of money, but he thought some of the most brilliant philosophical and moral issues. He thought them through and expressed them brilliantly more than any, possibly any ancient thinker. And he comes of age in the great age of Greek learning when the uh, Buddha was alive um, in, in a period where there's enormous fermentation intellectual in the world. So hist global historians tend to call that the axial age. Despite these rebuffs, because of his disciples, he becomes the major influence on Chinese civilization for over two and a half millennium, right down to the present day. Even the communist regime in China today still leans very heavily on Confucian teaching. His teachings also affect Vietnam, uh, Central Asia, Japan, and uh, Korea. Uh, and they are, as I said, they are, uh, they've become universal. Uh, he lived in this very rough time, and most of the philosophy of the time was about uh, repression, about making war. Um, so again, he wasn't popular in his time, but he came up with a brilliant formula uh, that essentially informs Chinese society, Chinese politics, right to the, as I mentioned, right to the present day, but certainly the time, time of the dynasty. As one might expect, he was an advocate of strong government but he was an, uh, essentially believed in rulers who cared about the people and took care of the people and also um, believed in uh, an, ed an educated intellectual bureaucracy, bureaucrats. And these in fact become the pivotal people in Chinese civilization who are trained, but they are not specialists. They're not like Americans now or Europeans or Chinese now where we're highly specialized and we do certain things, but they dabbled in all kinds of things and they were expected to cultivate the arts they were expected to be gentlemen, and they were always men. There were no women in his view of who should rule, but they ruled in the interest of the people. This is revolutionary. They ruled in the interest of the people, and if they didn't take care of the people, there was even a clause in, in, his, in one of his disciples thinking that said they had a right to uh, revolt. The other thing that he establishes in terms of the social order, he focuses on stability, and the stability is based on one, accepting one's position in life. So if you were high born, you accepted that. If you were low born laborer, you accepted that. If you were a man, you accepted the fact that you could have political power and influence. If you were a woman, you expected to be, um, to be subordinate. He also set up famously um, the five crucial relationships, the emperor and his subjects, the father and his son, the older brother, the younger brother, the husband, the wife, uh, and friend and friend, interestingly, uh, friend, uh, friend and friend. These were the key relationships, and they still are in Chinese society, in that order um, uh, Chinese society. So the order was hierarchical, uh, but it was stable. And in times of long periods of peace, China is the most successful civilization in all, over, the, over millennium in all of history, uh, and Confucian ideas have a great deal, um, a great deal to do, do with that. So remarkably, this 
man who had everything, it seems everything against him, um, emerges, as I mentioned, as one of the great, uh, not just philosophical, not just political, but moral philosophers of all time.